So I just want to give you some very practical things that you can implement in your life. They really need to begin in your home. But let's start with the principle. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Before you turn the page, there's two requirements there <coughs> of people who come to God. You have to believe that he exists. There is a God. But more importantly, perhaps, he rewards those who diligently seek him. The effort to seek God never goes unrewarded. That is so important. You're either moving towards God or you're moving away from him. If your life was evaluated by outsiders, what would their explanation be these days? Are you moving towards him or are you moving away from him? Do you think you got all your God business done so you can walk out into the world pretty free and not be encumbered by that? Or are you living with the idea and the attitude of someone who's newly arrived and you have a hungry desire to understand and implement more? I'll tell you who's at risk, those of us with the longest tenure in the church. It has my attention because I've been in the church my adult life. And I want the season ahead of me to be the most diligent, the most learning filled, the most growth filled of any season of my life. I'm not stopping. I'm not quitting. I'm not hitting cruise control. I don't intend to coast forward. I don't want to be middle of the road or lukewarm or indifferent. My goal isn't to be perceived as being the most tolerant. I don't want to be angry or belligerent or condemning, but I want to, let's just tape the pedal to the floor Amen. and ask the Lord to help us steer. Amen. You're clapping, but I'm about to give you some to-dos. <laughs> so how do we gain spiritual strength? I, I built this list really thinking of the most practical things I could that you could incorporate into your life and your home. I think they belong in your home and your practice. I was reluctant because I don't want to add burdens to parents. It's a difficult assignment and you don't need somebody wagging their finger saying you should do this. But if you want to accelerate the spiritual growth in your home, these practices will help you. Some of them you know as public parts of worship, but they're appropriate in your home, in your circle of friends, in your discretionary time. When you get, if you'll get together with your friends and do ungodly things, why is it you won't get together with your friends and do godly things? Amen. So some of these, there's a list of seven. You don't have them all because I knew I wasn't going to get to them all. I did the first couple in the previous session, but I just want to tag them for you. You can go back and hear the fuller explanations. If you, if you want to, all of the previous sessions are posted someplace on your wall or your board. I don't know where they are. They're in the cloud. <laughs> the first was communion, the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And I gave you a verse of scripture because if you're not familiar with this in a private setting, it feels pretty intimidating and you want a biblical basis to begin that. If I were going to celebrate communion in my home or with a group of friends, I would want to read a scripture. And so I gave you the biblical passage that grads, it's what Paul shared with his friends in Corinth when he was redirecting their behavior. They'd gotten into some trouble on how they celebrated communion. And so he was giving them kind of a corrective and he gave them the theological background for it in that passage I gave you in 1 Corinthians 11. I'm not going to read it to you, but you can take communion in your home with your family. You can take it with your extended family at a holiday. You can take it with your friends on a vacation and say, we're, we're taking a few days away from our routine. Let's invite God into the midst of this time away that we might know him better. I would submit to you, that's, that's every bit as important as whatever you're going to experience or see or enjoy. It's not like we're taking a vacation from God. You see, we treat worship and church and God almost like it's a, it's like a vitamin. You, know, you, you don't want too much of it. Too much of it wouldn't be good for you. I mean, we've, we've absorbed that from our culture. It'll talk about toxic religion. And I'm, yeah, you can make things toxic, but you're not, God is not toxic. And you don't want seasons of your life where you're away from him. You don't want to coach your children to that. Your children will learn far more by what they observe from you than what you tell them. Right. So communion in that private setting is important. With your friends is important. Well, I've got a friend who's coming who's not a Christian. Gee, what it would be if they got exposed to six or eight people that thought Jesus was real enough that they brought their faith into their private life. 
I've never done that before. I know, it's why we're talking about it. Well, at church, you always have these handy dandy little communion things. We either have trays with little cups that Jesus blessed, or we have little wafers with crosses stamped in them. Do I have to have the special wafer and the special cup? No, I don't believe you do. We typically take communion with unleavened bread, which means there was no yeast in it. It looks like a cracker. Do you have to receive communion with unleavened bread? No, you don't biblically. Leaven in scripture, Jesus warned the disciples to beware the leaven of the Pharisees. So unleavened bread is typically a symbol of purity or holiness or cleanliness, but it's not a requirement to take communion with unleavened bread. If I were gonna take communion in a private setting, maybe a, a saltine cracker, if I could choose, I would use a, a cracker and some sort of grape juice. But it's not a requirement. We're gonna take communion before we leave today. And I'll invite our online friends to go grab whatever they can put their hands on, a slice of Wonder Bread and a cup of milk. In fact, I met a person, family this week. They said they lived in California. They said, we take communion with you at church. And they said, we were never ready. You only give us about 30 seconds. <laughs> so she brought me this little bag and she said, we use these little mini vanilla Oreos. <laughs> and she said, now we keep a stash where we watch service. So if you decide on a wild idea to have communion, we're ready. I don't want you to intentionally be disrespectful, but I want you to take your faith outside the church. Dad, you can have communion. You can preside over a communion. Moms, you can too, but men are often more reluctant. Well, what if we do it wrong? Let me help you. You mean, what if you try to honor the Lord and you don't get it just right? Don't be disrespectful. Don't treat it flippantly. Turn off the football game while you're doing it. Sit down, focus everybody on the moment, honor the Lord, invite him into your home. I don't believe that's displeasing to the Lord. It would be more displeasing, in my opinion, to, to submit to you that you needed to have my authority in order to have communion than it would be for me to commission you. There's a second thing we talked about in a previous session. And again, I won't belabor it, but I want to invite you towards you. you can go back and hear the details. That's anointing. Taking oil and praying for one another or for something. Oil in scripture is a type of the Holy Spirit. Type meaning a symbol of. And so anointing something with oil is an invitation for the Spirit of God to be present in that life or to use something for the purposes of God. And both are very much a part of scripture, the anointing of people and the anointing of inanimate, inanimate objects, things. When they built the temple, when they built the tabernacle, when Moses gave them instructions for the tabernacle, there was very clear instructions that they were to anoint all of the articles that were used in the tabernacle. The tables and the tools and the altars and all of those things because they wanted the presence of God to be there. So if I were moving into a new apartment or a new house or a new place or a new dorm room, I think it's most appropriate. I would anoint that place. Well, how would you do that? Well, if it were me, I would just anoint the door and say, God, let this be a place where your presence is welcome. Amen. Now, if you'll allow me, I wouldn't post it on social media. Well, why not? I want all of my friends to know I'm a Christian. Maybe my personality. But when I'm doing my best to honor the Lord, I do my best not to draw unnecessary attention to it. If I'm going to pray for the office where I work. I don't stand on my desk and swing a chicken over my head. <laughs> Nor do I post a prayer and says, this was the prayer I paid for all the pagans where I work today. No. There's a time to make your faith public, but I think there's a time to have some wisdom in how you do it. Parents, I would anoint my kids. That's right. If it's the beginning of a school year, maybe you anoint them and say, I just, God, let it be a, a year unique with your blessings. We want to invite you into the beginning of this year. We give you anointing oil around here from time to time. It hadn't been too long since we gave you some. I, I, didn't, I don't think our latest version was this one. This one says, Jesus is Lord. And to be completely honest, this is chapstick. We buy it and we repurpose it. 
because a little a bottle of oil in your pocket or your purse is more problematic. One mom came and told me that she, she caught her kids early, young. One of them wasn't well and said the other one came back in. She said, I got the chapstick from church. I'm going to pray for you. Aww. The kids get it. You know, just if you've never done that, if that is so foreign to you, I just take a little bit. Usually I'll, I'll just make the sign of the cross on somebody's forehead. Amen. One, if I'm praying for somebody I don't know, that's a safe place for me to get involved. You can do it on the back of their hand if that's safer. But you want to invite the presence of the Lord into those places, into any of those significant beginnings in your life. What part of your life do you not want to invite the Lord into? You don't have to be weird about it. But again, as, as fathers in our homes, in the midst of our faith, it's got to get out of this building. We do. I know the verse in James. If you're sick, call the elders of the church. The, the word for elder, you know, we have to decide if we're interested in titles and labels or we're interested in function. We've gotten way heated up about titles. I'm far more interested in the function. Right. An elder really just means someone with a bit of experience. So if there's someone you know that's prayed for somebody else and you've got a need, let them pray for you. I know people with titles that have very little real world in understanding. You have all know somebody with a title and nobody's following them. Anointing. I want to get to the third one because I'm about out of time. and I haven't gotten anything new. We're talking about things to strengthen now, to, to, let, to, to bring spiritual strength into your life, into your home, when there are things that will flourish outside the church. This one's serving. In Matthew 23, Jesus said, the greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The implication is that serving carries with it some sense of humility. It's not pride-based. It's not self-promoting. It's not about achievement. Jesus said, if you intend to be significant in the kingdom of God, you're going to have to be a servant. Right. Now, I'm not recruiting for anything today. You're safe today. But I'm telling you, if this is not a part of your life practice, you are forfeiting significance in the kingdom of God. Right. So well, I don't like it. Okay. Do it anyway. Now, there's many ways to serve. One of the, 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 the phrases that's been become a part of this discussion in our kind of a world is servant leader. I think it's a good idea. The best definition I ever heard wasn't mine. I, I, I borrowed it from Ken Blanchard. He said a servant leader isn't someone who gets coffee for everybody, but it's someone who's willing to get coffee for anyone. Amen. 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 And it's just simply, it's, it's more about an attitude of the heart. It cultivates humility. And if you'll allow me, I don't believe we ever come to become too mature in the Lord, too experienced, too grown up, that we no longer need to serve. In Matthew 20, Jesus again, he said, with you, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Now, I don't know about you, but I will tell you, I want to be significant in the kingdom of God. I don't mean stadiums filled with people significant. I don't mean great resume over whatever. I mean like when the angel came to Daniel and said, Daniel, you are highly esteemed by God. He's a slave in a foreign country. He's most probably a eunuch. Everything about his life speaks to defeat and oppression. And when the angel comes, he said, in the halls of heaven, you are held in high esteem. I don't suppose that I'm going to attain Daniel's status, but I intend to live my life in such a way that it's valued in the kingdom of God. Amen. Then I would encourage you to do the same. And spoiler alert, sitting in church is probably not going to raise that value. Just it's who we are when we leave here. Right. So service becomes a part of this equation. And Jesus goes on, whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So maturity, significance in the kingdom of God is not about entitlement. 
Now, I, I will grant you, there are times and places where we have to be willing to lead and we have to make decisions. But in my own life, I see to it that on a regular basis, I still engage with small groups of people to listen and talk. I will purposefully do that. I will engage in activities that I don't have to engage in. I choose to be a part of them because I want that in my practice and my routine and my habit. And I hope you do too. If you have young children at home, let them know that you do that. Let them hear you do that with joy and enthusiasm. There's a difference in serving God and just being a community servant. Don't muddy it for them. I believe in serving a community. I do that as well. But it's very important to me that I be engaged in serving the people of God. And I would encourage you to cultivate that in your life. We are servants of the Lord. If Jesus understood his role is to be a servant, not to claim privilege, not to claim honor, not to claim uniqueness, but to demonstrate the characteristics of his heavenly father and of the kingdom he represented to the people, then just perchance you and I as Christ followers should practice being servants. The only way to serve isn't in an assignment from the church. I'm not suggesting that to you, but I can tell you we work hard to create some places with a little structure around them. So with minimal effort, you can come in, serve and get the victory lap. We will work together. It's a part of our commitment as a community of faith to create engagement points where people that have never exercised that muscle can do it with some pretty minimal commitment. But I hope you don't stay at minimal commitments, that you will grow as a result of that. Serving the Lord. I don't think you can make an argument that you serve the Lord if you don't serve his people. The way I know to serve the Lord is to serve his people. It's not theoretical to me. I've given my strength to that. Again, it's the pathway to significance in the kingdom of God. If you want to gain spiritual strength, you want to begin to serve. We want to take the practices of our faith and give expression to them in our lives. Go into the marketplace, go into where you work, and without telling anybody what you're doing, find a way to give an expression of service. Wash the coffee mug, clean the pot, empty a trash can, put paper in the copier. Don't fight for the best parking place. Be early for a meeting. Act like your time is not more valuable than everybody else's time. Don't announce it. Don't sell. Just leave it between you and the Lord. But begin to serve in that place at home. Let your children participate with you in expressions of service. Tell them why. Don't announce it. Let them see it become a part of the fabric of your life. Folks, we have not been living our faith. We need a grassroots change. We are so determined that somebody will go to the White House and be different. Until we go to our house and be different, the White House isn't going to change. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel. You know the drill, hit the bell for notifications. If you want to, leave a comment.